Hello, everybody. Welcome all. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Laurent Bossard. I'm uh, the director of the Sahel and West Africa Club uh, Secretariat. I'm very, very happy to welcome you to this uh, launch meeting of uh, our last uh, report on Africa's Urbanization Dynamics 2022, which is dedicated dedicated, sorry, uh, to the economic power of Africa's cities. You uh, obviously understand because we, you just uh, uh, add the, 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 the videos that uh, we will have uh, interpretation dur during this uh, one hour um, meeting. So do not hesitate to use interpretation. Uh, I have also to specify that the audience can raise questions in the chat box chat box throughout the webinar and we will select some of the questions uh, and uh, um, for uh, answering uh, them at the, the end of this uh, of this meeting i'm really pleased and, and proud to uh, introduce two uh, speakers for the opening remarks first dr ibrahim hassan mayaki who is, uh, as you may know, Chief Executive Officer of the African Union Development Agency and Honorary President of Sahel and West Africa Club. And also uh, Mrs. Edlam Abera Yemeru, who is Acting Director, Gender, Poverty and Social Policies Division uh, at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Before giving them the floor for the in, in, in uh, opening remarks, I would like also to welcome uh, Mr. Salomon Kainor, who is Vice President, Private Sector Infrastructure and Industri Industrialization at the African Development Bank. And uh, uh, Mr. Kainor will do the uh, closing remarks of this uh, meeting. So let me uh, give the floor for the first opening remark to Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Mayaki. Mr. Mayaki, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Bossa. And let me recognize my dear friend and brother, uh, Solomon Quainor, uh, Vice President of the African Development Bank. Good to see you, Solomon. And uh, recognize Ms. Yemeu. Uh, of the Economic Commission for Africa and pass our regards to, to Vera, please. Mm -hmm. So we, um, in 2020, uh, we launched uh, the first edition of Africa's Urbanization Dynamics, uh, Africa Police, uh, mapping a new urban geography in the margins of the African Union Summit in Addis Ababa, based on an analysis of more than 7,000 7,700 uh, cities uh, and towns in 50 countries, spanning a, a period of 60 years. The report describes an African urban reality characterized by its pace, its diversity, and also in certain way, its uniqueness. It did show how and where cities are growing how cities emerge, how intimately they are linked to rural dynamics, how we construct new territories. It showed a new urban geography of Africa. And this new urban geography is uh, evolving in an accelerated pace. Building on this and uh, this time together with the African Development Bank and the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, which cooperation we highly appreciate. Now, two years later, we launched the second edition on the economic power of Africa cities. This new report, in a way, is a logical sequel. Two years ago, we described the physical a territorial reality of urbanization. Today, we present a social and economic reality of Africa's urbanization. Again, this report is based on an impressive, impressive data analysis. More than 4 million 
individuals and firms in 2,600 cities across 32 countries, which is unique in its breadth and level of detail. And again, it shows an urban reality, a social economic reality of the economic power of cities that will surprise many readers. For both reports, I stressed the importance of data analysis and evidence in its production, because I believe that not only without it, we would have a less complete description of the situation, but also we would not be able to better understand contexts and dynamics, which would also limit our ability to think about the right strategies and policies that Africa should develop to benefit fully from the opportunity urbanization presents for people and businesses. Let me give you one example from the report. Across most social economic dimensions, Africa cities significantly outperform the countries in which they are located. And they have maintained their economic performance despite growing by 500 million over the last 30 years, providing several hundred millions with better jobs and improved access to services and infrastructure. This in a context of very limited public support and investment, probably one of the most underappreciated achievements of African cities. I would like to end by stressing the importance and the satisfaction of our collaboration, this collaboration between the African Development Bank, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and the Sahel and West Africa Club of the OECD that gave rise to this report. It highlights the, critically, the criticality of linking evidence with policies and policies with adequate funding and adequate implementation processes. At the same time, it also shows the need for more collaborations, more synergies, more evidence to support the design of comprehensive policy packages at all levels going forwards. All levels meaning nationally, regionally, continentally. I thank you. I think you are- Oh, leaving. sorry, yes. <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Ibrahim. Thank you very much, Dr. Mayaki. Um, uh, for your kind words for, for our joint work. Uh, you, you, you're right, we need to insist on the fact that it is a joint work with, uh, with these three institutions. And this is why I, I'm really, really pleased to now give the floor to Edlam Aberayimeru, who is, uh, as I previously said, IT Director, Gender, Poverty and Social Policy Division, United Nations Economic Commission for Africa. Mrs. Yemero, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Hassan Mayaki, Mr. Salomon uh, Kainor of AFDB, dear participants, uh, greetings to all of you. I'm really pleased to be here with you uh, today from ECA. And I also wish to share with you the greetings from um, Vera Songwe, the Under Secretary General of the United Nations and the Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa, who unfortunately could not join us today. I'm really quite proud and uh, pleased to be here today uh, at the culmination of a process that uh, we started uh, some time back and to launch a report that we produced through an excellent uh, collaboration uh, between uh, ECA, the OECD, uh, Sahel and West Africa Club, and of course the African Development Bank as already mentioned. This was really a fruitful collaboration and uh, one that we would want to uh, look at going forward. So the focus of the report is indeed very timely and it provides a fresh new perspective on the impact of urbanization on Africa's economic and social development. Uh, as Dr. Mayaki said, using new data and analysis previously not available. 
and answering some of the key questions that we have been grappling with with regards to Africa's urbanization. We have been asking what is really the true impact of urbanization in Africa across uh, you know, economic and social development. And this report does provide some of the answers to those questions. Of course, the report is of um, interest and relevance for African policy makers, but also beyond the continent, given that, as we know, the future of global urbanization is actually uh, going to take place in Africa together with Asia. Africa's urban transition is reshaping the continent at a very fast pace. And this shift is not just demographic, but equally also, it is an economic and social transition. And the report does clearly show the key dynamics and uh, trends related to these transitions. We know that already African cities drive economic growth, uh, city level revenues are critical in financing uh, development in the continent, and the kind of jobs, decent and productive jobs that Africa needs so urgently uh, are also located in urban areas. And so we can clearly say that uh, urbanization is a foundation for economic growth that is job rich, that is inclusive, and measurably leads to the eradication of extreme poverty and inequality in Africa. And again, the report does provide evidence uh, around this. Indeed, urbanization can be much more of a positive game changer for the continent, but it does require action. As that continent experiences the world's fastest urban growth rate, the time to think and act urban is now and not later. And when we look at uh, the demographic um, transition in Africa, Focusing on the fact that the majority of the population is rural can at times be misleading. We must look beyond where people are living today and consider the pace at which we are experiencing urban growth and the impact of this change in both urban and rural areas. Cities and urban growth need to be planned in advance. It is impossible and sometimes too expensive to undo and redo the physical form of cities and urban areas once urbanization happens. And also Africa has a unique opportunity to get urbanization right as most of its urban growth has not yet taken place. The fact that the urban transition is overlapping with a youth transition in the continent makes the question even more urgent. Between 1980 and 2015, Africa experienced a 362% increase in the number of youth residing in urban areas. Catering for the need of these urban youth will be hugely demanding and challenging. Indeed, Africa needs to um, create as much as 18 million jobs every year until 2035, excluding North Africa. We also know that urbanization is happening at the same time as the continent is facing a number of risks of course, uh, climate risks are a primary uh, consideration and uh, focus for the continent. And we do know that cities are at risk of climate related disasters, but they also offer opportunities for building climate resilience. And as Africa looks to uh, economic recovery from the pandemic and other exogenous shocks that are currently unfolding, it becomes critical to integrate cities and local governments into those processes. Of course, a major priority for any action towards uh, sustainable urbanization is to tackle the serious data gaps that we face when it comes to urbanization. The current report makes a contribution in that respect, but we must do more to tackle the urban data challenges in the continent, especially with respect to economic and financial indicators. At ECA, we're working with our member states to support them in leveraging the economic potential of urbanization. And of course, we look forward to continued collaboration with partners present here today and others uh, as we seek to um, leverage the report for actual policy design and implementation in Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Yemeru, uh, for this first uh, flavor of this uh, report and uh, you will be part of the presentation that will come uh, immediately of this report 
which will be uh, presented by uh, Philippe Heinrichs, who is the head of Unique Cities and Urbanization in uh, our secretariat here in Paris in Silent West Africa Club by you, Madame Mrs. Uh, Yemeru. Uh, I remind that you are acting director gender, poverty and social policy division at the uh, ECA. And also uh, by um, Mrs. Alice Nabalamba, who is regional urban development coordinator at the African Development Bank. So now I would, uh, I'm really pleased to give the floor to Philippe Heinrichs, who, who will start this uh, very, very substantive and innovative presentation. Uh, Philippe, you have the floor. Hello and a very warm welcome also from me and thank you for joining and your interest in, in this presentation of our joint work on the economic power of Africa city. I hope you can uh, see the slides now and I will go straight into the presentation. Let me start by saying a couple of important words on the data and the context of the analysis. The analysis is based on microdata from more than 4 million individuals and firms in 2,600 cities across 34 countries. These indicators produce, provide a new perspective on African cities that is unprecedented in breadth and level of detail. The data covers both individuals in the formal as well as in the informal economy and is therefore representative in our view of Africa's economies. The second point, since only geocoded data was used in this work, we could link all data observations to cities in our Africa data, Africa Polis database. And it's this matching that allows us to analyze and compare cities across different sizes and analyze them within their local and national context. And let me have another last point on the I'm sorry. Uh, the last point is on the context and probably the most important context. And this has already been mentioned before. Over the past 30 years, Africa has been urbanizing at an unprecedented pace and scale in human history. Africa's urban population has tripled in size, growing by more than four, 500 million people. It is crucial to keep this dynamic in mind when looking at the data and evaluating performance. To go straight in, let me summarize in three points the economic power of Africa cities. First, our analysis shows that cities outperform the countries in which they are located in almost all measurable dimensions. And this gap in performance is larger than in other parts of the world, highlighting the benefits of Africa's cities and urbanization. In addition, large cities perform better than smaller cities and smaller cities perform much better than rural areas. You will see this trend in all slides. What it shows is that many benefits from urbanization already materialize in small cities. Second, the socioeconomic performance allows us to calculate that over the past 20 years, urbanization has contributed to 30% of Africa's GDP per capita growth, a significant figure. This third point, a very important one also from a policy perspective, is that urbanization also benefits rural areas with proximity to cities linked to better socioeconomic performance in rural areas. On this slide, we have selected a number of indicators that highlight how cities drive economic performance. The share of skilled jobs is on average two and a half times higher in cities and this share increases with city size, an observation that is linked to a different economic structure and that is confirmed by data we have on sector employment shares. 
The data here is disaggregated by gender, which shows that men do have much higher access to skilled employment than women. However, women in cities have a higher probability of being in wage employment or in skilled employment than men in rural areas. Modest gains, but gains nevertheless. Urban residents are three times more likely to be in wage employment than their rural counterparts. Wage employment is widely accepted to be an important driver of socioeconomic development. And wages are up to 100% higher in cities. On the business side, we have, where we had much less data coverage, we can see that firms and cities are twice as likely to invest in research and development and product development, which are key drivers of productivity growth. We also present data in the report that shows exports from urban firms are more likely to have higher value addition, less raw materials, and exports are more intracontinental. Overall, this performance is also reflected in the wealth distribution of households with massive differences between the largest cities and rural areas. We see that 59% of population in the largest cities are in the top wealth quintile compared to only 4% in the rural population. An important aspect here is that wealth is often also linked to other socioeconomic outcomes such as better health. Moving to a more socioeconomic analysis, on this slide, some indicators that besides showing socioeconomic performance, we believe are also indicative of the long-term potential of urbanization. Clearly, a starting point is education. With urban residents receiving on average two, two and a half to four years more education than rural residents, particularly noteworthy here is, women in small cities have more years of education than men in rural areas and that with city size, the gap between men and women reduces. We also know that the benefits from education to economic and social well-being are not one-off, but accrue over the person's lifetime. In terms of access to services and infrastructure, maybe not surprising, again, a significant gap between rural areas and cities, and massive gaps between smaller cities and rural areas. Here, it is worth mentioning that this average figure in particular hides some considerable differences across countries and across cities. Dependency ratios, the share of the economically active, economically non-active age brackets to economically active is 50% lower in cities. Uh, just let me pause here. I can see that we have issues with the graphs on the slides, uh, but you can access them in the report and, and see all the data. All oh, apologies for that. Um, a reduction in the dependency ratio is an important driver of economic growth, often referred to as the demographic dividend. For us, the lower de dependency ratios in cities is a reflection of different economic structures in cities and better educational attainment of men and women. Last but not least, some indicators on what we consider to be relevant for facilitating an inclusion into more formal economic activities like bank account ownership, owning title to a house, for instance, are crucially important for accessing finance and developing business activities, investing in health and education, are again significantly higher in urban areas than in rural areas. In summary, a clear pattern of cities benefits emerges and probably also an indication of its long-term benefits. This is the third message from the beginning and in our view, crucially important. Cities and urbanization benefit rural areas. One often ignored aspect is that urbanization increases the intensity of rural urban linkages. Firstly, shown by the animation on the second slide and the growth in the urban population and the number of cities that has doubled since the 1990s from 3,300 to 7,700. And this increase in the number of cities naturally decreases the distance between urban and rural areas. Today, 
50% of the rural population live within 14 kilometers of a city. The graph on this slide that unfortunately you cannot really see shows that for two thirds of rural inhabitants, the closest cities are small between 10 to 50,000 inhabitants. And secondly, linked to the economic transformation and specialization in cities, the intensity of flows and goods of goods and services between urban and rural areas increases. What you can see on these graphs is that the performance across many of the indicators like education, wealth and access to banking is closely uh, in rural areas is closely linked to distance from a city with rural areas closer to a city performing better than more distant areas. This graph that you can see is the relation between the share of skilled jobs in rural areas and distance. Also here, a clear decrease with distance is evident. It translates how proximity to cities offers access to economic networks and opportunities that are also essential for developing the rural economy. And since in many cases, the closest city is a small city, this underscores the need on a policy level to also invest in smaller and intermediary cities to look at the whole urban network, a point that will be taken up by my colleagues Adla Miemeru and Alice Nambalamba in the following presentation. Let me quickly present you an analysis we did in a report on the importance of city clusters. Many of the world's most successful cities are part of a larger cluster of cities, also in Africa. Clusters provide cities with an economic ecosystem of suppliers, investors, infrastructure, that is much larger than that of any individual city. And in this sense, they are particularly important for intermediary cities that can benefit from economic density of closed cities. Based on a spatial analysis, we have identified 32 city clusters in Africa that account for roughly 60% of Africa's total urban population and half of them are inland. Also, because many of these clusters are very young in Africa and just emerging, they are lacking the economic and physical connectivity to benefit from this proximity. Therefore, while designing and planning investments and in national urban policies, it is important to consider such city clusters as complementarity. This also is particularly re relevant in our view in the context of the African continental free trade area. Let me end with a slide that picks up a somewhat more nuanced tone. Although the indicators shown in the preceding slides confirm the economic power of Africa's cities, the data shows little improvement over time in many of these, and especially compared to other emerging, emerging regions of the world. Clearly, the growth dynamic I mentioned just maintaining comparative performance vis-a-vis -vis the national context, absorbing 500, additional, 500 million additional residents is a strong achievement in itself and worth stressing again. However, it also shows that Africa cities are less well-planned, less equipped, and less well-funded than in other parts of the world, which nicely links to the presentations of my colleague, Adam and Alice. Thank you very much. So this is uh, Yemeru, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to present to you uh, a part of the report that is focused on the policy implications of the findings that, was, that were just presented uh, to you. The main message of this part of the report is that cities, urbanization and local governments must be brought to the center of national economic policy making uh, for the reasons that were presented earlier and given the critical role of cities in economic and social development. Cities matter for economic policy in Africa for a number of reasons. Let me highlight just three of those. First, the productivity of cities is an important factor for economic growth and job creation in Africa. Productive cities that offer economic advantages 
for both businesses and households are better able to contribute to increased economic growth. Furthermore, productive jobs that Africa needs in manufacturing and modern services are located mainly in urban areas. These are urban sectors. So cities that are well-planned and have good infrastructure and services are important for the expansion of those sectors of the economy. Secondly, national economic policies have a significant impact in shaping the spatial and urban development form of countries. Very often, infrastructure and economic investment projects, such as transportation uh, projects, special economic zones, and other investments transform existing cities, create new ones, and change the overall spatial configuration of countries. This needs to be anticipated and coordinated at the national level. Thirdly, the investments and actions required to transform African cities so they realize their productive potential cut across several sectors and policies. And those investments and actions require long-term vertical and horizontal coordination. Again, this calls for national, national level coordination and alignment with economic priorities. Also, uh, in this part of the report, uh, the, the uh, ways in which we should prioritize cities in national economic policy uh, are presented in, in detail. The report uh, recognizes that despite their importance for national economies, cities are often not adequately prioritized at the core of national development planning. Very often, urbanization is integrated in African national development planning from quite a narrow perspective and focused on a single dimension without adequate linkages to other sector policies and priorities. This means that spatial and economic planning is not adequately connected in national development processes. And this is quite costly. As a result, African cities very often face high costs of doing business and living. Lost productivity, employment, and competitiveness is observed. And when it comes to the national system of cities in African countries, very often we observe low connectivity of infrastructure and networks between cities and between cities and rural areas. And finally, uh, due to the inadequate linkages between spatial and economic planning, we also observe weak targeting of investments and lower returns on investments. When it comes to uh, some of the priority actions as to how to bring cities to the center of national economic policies, the report highlights four key priorities. First is to prioritize sectors that will create urban jobs at a large scale. In many instances in national development planning, the sectors that are prioritized are not necessarily going to create urban jobs at the scale that is required. A second priority is to invest in infrastructure and service provision in cities so that we begin to address um, in measurable ways, the barriers that African cities face that constrain their productivity and raise costs for businesses and households. These relate to, for example, transport, housing, uh, energy, uh, and, and other services and infrastructure necessary for economic um, productivity. Third is to improve the connectivity between urban areas and urban areas and rural areas within the national urban system, and therefore promoting their differentiated and often complementary economic roles and functions. And finally, the report emphasizes that there is a need to strengthen vertical and horizontal coordination of policy across economic sectors. And also this is important in terms of boosting revenues, and the data investments are also uh, highlighted as a priority. The report also in this part looks more closely at local governments and economic development. It queries and analyzes the role of local governments in economic development. 
It recognizes that local governments are essential actors, economic actors, but very often they are perceived in terms of service delivery. And so the report, um, uh, uh, the report posits that uh, although they play an important economic role, local governments face a number of challenges in terms of becoming even more uh, effective economic actors. Very often, local governments in Africa are responsible for only 11% of all public investment. When it comes to how uh, it may be uh, possible to empower local governments even further so that they drive economic development, again, a, a starting point is to recognize their vital economic role uh, beyond service delivery. And it also requires some, some actions to, to um, address the constraints that they face in terms of playing out their economic uh, roles, economic development uh, leadership. This requires coordination and complementarity between national and local governments. Uh, they are complementary, their functions are complementary. And it's also quite important to address some of the challenges within the legal and institutional frameworks uh, that are necessary for local governments to uh, realize their real potential as economic actors, in particular issues of decentralization, fiscal decentralization, and building administrative capacities. Finally, uh, the report presents some key principles for uh, local economic development. Uh, one key principle is to focus on um, the existing economic advantages of cities and urban areas and build on those advantages and therefore promote economic specialization uh, based on uh, the particular qualities and attributes of a city or an urban location. It's also important to uh, advance and expand the R&D research and development component in collaboration with univers universities and higher education institutions. So this uh, links quite well to the next presentation, which looks much more closely at the question of local finances, finance at the local level, and some of the uh, trends uh, related to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yemeru. It was really, really clear, crystal clear. Thank you so much. Uh, now I give the floor uh, to Alice Nabalamba, uh, who will present us the third part of uh, the, the, the report uh, focused on financing. Alice, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Um, now that we have established the economic power of Africa's cities, uh, we now move on to what may be hindering if at all, the potential for even greater performance uh, of the cities. I'll just make a few uh, remarks on the uh, uh, current fiscal state of African cities, uh, some of the uh, challenges that uh, uh, are being faced, and also uh, to conclude with uh, how we develop uh, local fiscal capacity in those cities. Our analysis uh, in this uh, book has uh, revealed that uh, African cities command very low budgets and, uh, and very little uh, revenues. Revenues uh, in cities account for only 16% of the total government uh, revenues uh, compared to the global average of 26% and 64% for North America, for example which is four times that of Africa. Because of these low revenues, uh, investments in, um, in infrastructure or services are also low, something that is uh, holding back the economic development of uh, our cities. Our cities uh, invest on average 47%, 47 uh, US dollars uh, per capita uh, versus the world average of uh, 313 uh, dollars per capita. Uh, the, this, uh, the corresponding figure for Latin America is $163, and for Asia Pacific, it's about $400 per capita, and to over $1,200 for North America. Now, the problems of low fiscal capacity. Uh, in Africa compounded by the fact that uh, fiscal decentralization has not been completed in a large number of countries. 
And this has prevented local governments uh, from pursuing effective local economic development of, of policies. This is uh, partly due to the fact that uh, national transfers uh, are generally limited. This is where uh, the transfer, this is where most of our uh, cities uh, derive uh, their revenue from uh, national transfers from, from, from central governments. Uh, the transfers also have a high share of conditionality and in some cases, by uh, the, 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 this revenue or this, uh, these transfers are earmarked for specific activities, which limits the fiscal control of the uh, local governments that receive them. Presently, 60% of cities receive mainly or only, um, or only conditional transfers. And unfortunately, these uh, transfers of grants tend to be unpredictable, both in terms of the amounts and uh, in terms of the uh, timing of disbursement, which complicates a long-term planning and uh, management. And finally, African cities generally are restricted in their ability to access uh, financial markets uh, to address the emerging and larger uh, infrastructure needs and services provision that are necessary for the growing urban populations. Now, in order to develop the uh, fiscal capacity of cities, multiple approaches would be needed. First, we need to look at ways to improve the quality of government transfers, which should be higher, more stable, and more predictable uh, than they are presently. At the same time, uh, cities need to scale up the mobilization of own source revenues, uh, for example, from property taxes, and user fees for uh, public services. They should be allowed to keep a larger share of the taxes that uh, they collect and be able to set appropriate tax rates. This would reduce the heavy reliance on, a transfer, on government transfers. National governments also need to put in place the enabling environment to improve the legal and institutional authority for local governments to raise the capital for investment that uh, would generate additional economic growth. For example, cities uh, could be allowed to issue municipal bonds and their administrative capacity should be strengthened to use taxes as an instrument of uh, uh, revenue generation. And finally, as uh, perhaps development partners, uh, we must collectively continue to support cities in imp uh, to improve their administrative and fiscal capacity. First, uh, to increase uh, investments in transformative uh, infrastructure and basic services. Uh, and secondly, to ensure cities' readiness to access financial markets, especially for local currency loans or debt. And thirdly, uh, to support local governments to improve uh, their credit worthiness. Now, at the African Development Bank, we have already that target cities that are ready the initiative would provide uh, the relevant uh, technical support for the relevant tools uh, and instruments for capital markets including credit ratings self assessment and the fiscal mitigation mechanisms among uh, other uh, among other tools. And finally, uh, municipal officers or uh, chief financial officers of cities will be introduced to the various bank uh, financial instruments, including climate finance and what subnational lending would mean vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, sovereign uh, lending and the requisites uh, to access bank financing uh, for urbanization at the local level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just uh, for the last slide on here, you have the links to the report and databases that you can access uh, more on that data, not only the country averages, but also comparing cities and within countries.
please go and check out the report and have a look at the figures that also you couldn't see in the beginning of the presentation. Thank you. OK, je vais maintenant parler un petit peu français euh, très rapidement pour dire que I'd like to speak in French just a little if I may just to say that we have a little less time than we expected for questions and answers but we still believe that we now and for the next uh, 10 years need to start a long process of questions and answers looking for common joint uh, solutions to uh, increase our knowledge on this essential uh, topic which is african uh, cities and their power their influence i'd like to ask only two questions because they are at this point to me very important the first one is to Mrs. Yemeru. You highlighted that rural areas do also benefit from cities, yet the differences between the two are extremely marked in most indicators you presented. What is the message to policymakers? How should they identify investment priorities? And at the end of the day, is there a battle between rural and urban and no choice as to and we think that no choice has to be made between the two but do you think that we will have a battle uh, competition in terms of investment between rural and urban areas mrs yemeru thank you for that question I, I think the straightforward answer is there is no battle and we will not end up in a battle in fact, the main message really is that um, the two agendas are inseparable in the African continent and cannot be um, cannot 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 be looked at in a siloed manner. They are highly connected by definition. The report has also shown how what is happening in urban areas has a direct impact in rural areas, and vice versa. Perhaps what we did not say earlier is that. What is happening in rural areas has also direct implications for the way in which we urbanize and for urban development, development as well. So I really want to focus on the complementarity. And in fact, for too long, we have uh, promoted a dichotomy between rural and urban development agendas in the continent. And I think it's high time that we look at these in tandem, uh, in coherence, and really uh, see how uh, urban development can benefit rural development and, and, and vice versa. I think in the structural transformation agenda of the continent, there is no way that we can look at the two agendas in a delinked uh, manner. So this is also why we're saying national development planning at the highest levels of policy making should connect urban and rural development policies and priorities, should connect economic sector policies and strategies so that urbanization is not looked at as a single sector issue that is connected to agricultural policy and uh, strategies, is connected to industrial and trade policies and strategies. So really it's, it's about complementarity. There is no battle and a focus on the battle is quite risky. And I think we need to undo that myth sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yemeru. I asked this question because it was uh, uh, ask it, it during the chat, and I think we will, you will have this question very frequently in the next, uh, in the coming years. And I think this will be at the center of the of the political uh, uh, debate. And I was think I was remembering a friend uh, that was always saying that you, with a you are for urban, are for rural, you are linked. <laughs> It's absolutely important. And I have another uh, important question from, from, the, from the chat uh, about the, 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 the fact that uh, and th this question is for, uh, uh, for um, Miss, um, no, yes, so, so yes, for, for Alice uh, Navalamba. Uh, you, why should, in your view, local governments proceed to borrow to borrow in light of the debt sustainability. I think this is also a question that we will be asked for the next uh, years and decades. What about borrowing for the, 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 the local government at the time where everybody say, 
the depth is too too heavy and so on. So, uh, Mrs. Uh, Alice Nabalamba, please. Alice, we cannot hear you. Can you hear us? I think she's having uh, Wi-Fi issues. Okay, so what I, I, I propose to, to this question to, to come back to Mrs. Yemeru. Sorry, Mrs. Uh, Yemeru. <laughs> oh, Alice is back. Yes, no, so Alice I'm is back. Sorry, so Alice, I had, uh, the connection issues, but uh, indeed uh, the question that you asked is uh, very valid. Uh, uh, first of all, infrastructure deficits are very high in Africa. We estimate that uh, uh, they range between uh, fifty-two billion dollars uh, and uh, ninety-two uh, billion per year, and uh, close to half of that is. Uh, related to infrastructure improvements and needs in, uh, in urban areas. Uh, the need uh, must be met uh, just, uh, or can't be met just, be, uh, just uh, with the local revenues that are being raised in cities today, as we uh, noted uh, earlier, uh, these are very low, uh, whereas uh, the needs are much, much higher. Uh, so borrowing becomes a necessary evil, if you know, one could say that. Uh, borrowing uh, is a driver of uh, improving financial management uh, in cities and subnational governments. Uh, it enhances uh, own source uh, revenue mobilization, and it instills uh, financial uh, discipline in institutions and the officers that are managing those resources on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, it improves uh, also uh, quality of uh, public expenditure, uh, among others, uh, because borrowers uh, understand that they must pay or they would be paying back uh, the debt. And uh, borrowing from, from multilateral institutions is even better because uh, it embeds uh, you know, capacity building of financial uh, and needs assessment or, ma or management and uh, risk, uh, as, uh, risk assessment as well. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, we have so many questions on, on the chat. And once again, we will continue the conversation and do not hesitate to be in touch with, with our team here and in, in, in Addis, in, uh, in Abidjan. Uh, I, I will, okay, I will take, uh, uh, give five minutes to, to my colleague, uh, um, uh, Philippe Heinrichs, about this. Uh, uh, we talk also a, a lot about uh, the, the, the city cluster yeah. and why are city clusters important for the economic development of the continent and how can they promote and or benefit from African continental free trade area? And for this question, I give the floor to my colleague, uh, Philippe Heinrichs. Yes, uh, thank you. The, the question of city clusters is indeed a very important one and this also links back to, to what uh, my colleague Alice just said about the infrastructure gap. So we know that there is a large infrastructure gap and investment gap in infrastructure. So pooling resources across a larger cluster can be a very beneficial way of, of uh, advancing. Also, we know that in Africa, the, we have a, a large group and growing share of intermediary cities. And especially in intermediary cities, the benefit from what is called borrowed agglomeration economies across city clusters are, are very interesting to pursue. And uh, a third and last point I would like to, to, to make is, is really the, the what we see is that many of these emerging city clusters are cross-border in Africa. So they do provide a really interesting opportunity for promoting continental integration, for using cities and city clusters as a way of accelerating continental integration. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Philippe. Thank, thank you all. We, unfortunately, unfortunately the, we are running out of time. Uh, um, 
but once again, do not hesitate to, 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 to keep in touch with, uh, with us, to go on our website, to read the, 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 this report. And uh, if you may, uh, we, and obviously we will have other opportunities to discuss this uh, report, uh, starting by the way, uh, um, by the next AfriCity uh, Summit, um, in uh, Kisumu, I think it's from uh, 17 to 21st of May. Uh, uh, you know that this summit uh, gather something uh, more all the, 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 the local governments and mayors of, of Africa and their partners, and we will be there. And we hope that we will have here again the opportunity to continue uh, the conversation. I would like us also to take this opportunity to thank uh, some uh, contributors to this report. Uh, we all the the what uh, presented to you uh, are coming from the first five chapter of the of the of the book. We have a fifth chapter which is very very important on the uh, on the policy implications and the policy dialogue around this uh, this uh, this issue. And we, uh, we had many contributors to this uh, chapter that I want to, to thank. Uh, we had uh, uh, Yvonne Aki uh, Sawyer Obe, mayor of Fritton. The mayor of Fritton contributed to this book. Jean-Pierre Elongbassi, our friend uh, Jean-Pierre, who is uh, Secretary General United Cities and Local Government of Africa, you see LGA, the organizer of the AfriCity Summit. Uh, Taiba La uh, Lawanson, uh, who is Professor of Urban Management and Governance at the University of Lagos. Thank you very much. And we had also uh, His Excellency Albert M. Muchanga, African Union, Commissioner for Economic Development, Trade and Mining. Thank you. Edgar also, Edgar P. Peterse, Director of the African Center for Cities, ACC, University of Cape Town, South Africa. Uh, and finally, um, if you allow me, I will uh, give the floor for the, the closing remarks to Solomon Kainor, uh, Vice President, Private Sector Infrastructure and Industrialization, African Development Bank. Mr. Kainor, you have the floor. And thank you very much for being with us. Uh, no, uh, thank you very much, actually, from me, because I think I enjoyed the conversation, uh, you know, very much. Uh, let me start off uh, once again by acknowledging this partnership, uh, you know, OECD, out of NEPAD, uh, UNECA, uh, my brother, Dr. Mayaki, good to see you as well. And, you know, thank you for the leadership uh, on this very important topic. Uh, and same to you, uh, Mrs. Yumero, uh, please extend my greetings also to Vera. Uh, that, you know, that this is actually a very appropriate, you know, uh, you know, topic as we focus on economic development and job creation uh, across Africa. Uh, and, and, and definitely thanks also to the partnership uh, with the OECD um, as well. So clearly we've established that urbanization is one of the most important transformations the African continent will undergo this century. And I was taking furious notes uh, as I was listening to, to all of you. And, and let me just share with you some of the clear messages that I heard. Evidence to policies to funding. Uh, you know, Dr. Mayaki, you know, made that clear. Uh, and, doc, you know, Mrs. Yamaru talked about the various transitions that we have to pay attention to, demogra demographic, economic, and social. In addition to the urban transition, we have to pay attention to the youth transition. And, and for us, this is one of the critical reasons that we're, we're looking to establish what we call youth entrepreneurship investment banks. Uh, if we do not actually create these opportunities for youth in this youth transition, uh, you know, this could be also a disaster for, for Africa. And while we're doing all of this uh, with the urban migration, we have to factor in you know, some of the key risks that we're looking at globally, such as climate risk. Uh, as we build in you know, infrastructure and services, we have to look at them from a climate resilient perspective. Uh, if we do not make that investment now, we would actually pay you know, higher costs you know, at a later date. It was great to see the level of 
you know, evidence gathered, you know, 4 billion people, 2,600 cities and 34 countries. Very impressive, very impressive. I, I like how you responded, um, this is your to this question about competition or complementarity, uh, urban development versus rural development. But it was great to see that, you know, this established the links between cities and rural areas, and that actually cities benefit rural areas. And going further, you know, this concept of clusters of cities, you know, the concept of clusters of cities really across the country uh, begins to actually, you know, look at secondary cities as well and not just, you know, the, the mega cities. So, so that was powerful. And going to your particular area of expertise, this is your merit, and, and a very important focus for us, addressing the gender inequality inequalities. It was great to see that, at least in the city's context, you know, things are better than in the rural context. So this allows us really in terms of policies and our interventions, uh, you know, just to really have a differentiated approach, both for cities as well as, you know, for rural areas. So I, I thought that was, uh, was, was key. Um, I mean, definitely, without a doubt, uh, all the speakers established that cities drive economic performance and job creation, and, and, and that's something that uh, you know was very was was very clear. But there are some challenges. I mean, um, you know, many of the cities are not well planned. Um, slum areas develop with you know unplanned urban migration. Uh, connectivity becomes an issue. Um, infrastructure becomes overburdened. But these also create opportunities that we have to, you know, we have to really look forward to. So here we need to invest in connected, connected infrastructure. And this is also where Alice came in. We also need to look at the capacity of cities. Uh, I, I, I listened carefully to uh, the question around borrowing and debt sustainability. But if you, you know, Alice correctly indicated that you have to first of all look at uh, the amount of you know, funding that comes from the national government, but also cities' abilities to generate their own revenue base uh, you know, through property taxes, et cetera. Uh, I would venture to say, you know, uh, from an infrastructure perspective, that where we see the bankable infrastructure projects or the better PPP opportunities are really in cities because of the people density and the ability to pay user fees and not necessarily depend uh, really on, on the subnationals, you know, uh, to pay. So that also creates, you know, a, a good reasons for, for cities to plan better, uh, also to do proper financial management, and then based on that capacity, do some, you know, uh, limited and, uh, you know, and sustainable borrowing uh, to continue to develop, you know, the right infrastructure and services uh, that should also generate revenues, uh, you know, within the our uh, subnational areas. So, just to cap off, you know, we at the AFPB are very, you know, positive about you know the information that has come out of this report. Uh, we, you know, we definitely have a lot of programs uh, in place. Uh, we have a Jobs for Youth initiative that responds to high levels of non of unemployment and underemployment, uh, coupled with increased vulnerability and inequality. Uh, it targets the creation of 25 million direct and indirect jobs and also to a quick, equip 50 million youth. Uh, we have what we call our FAWA program, uh, where we have you know, provided about $500 million of financing to various you know, financial intermediaries to date uh, to be able to fund women-owned businesses uh, all the way from the micro to the SME level. Uh, we also plan, you know, to actually achieve up to about $3 billion in five years. Uh, likewise, I did mention what we are looking to do with uh, youth entrepreneurship banks. Uh, and, and, you know, because we've recognized the potential really of uh, economic development, you know, at the city's level, uh, we've established an urban and municipal development uh, group, uh, you know, uh, run by Stefan Hatcher, of which Alice is a part. Uh, because we see that, you know, as we think through uh, trying to, you know, trying to uh, address, you know, the lack of infrastructure, you know, the lack of appropriate services for economic development and jobs creation, uh, tackling this at a subnational level is very important. Uh, likewise, we've, you know, developed our own internal, you know, PPP strategic framework 
uh, because we see a lot of potential really for PPPs to be used in the provision of infrastructure services at the subnational level. Um, so once again, I mean, let me close by saying, you know, thank you very much. You know, this is a very important publication, um, very timely, uh, even as we look at private sector development, which we haven't touched on. Uh, urban, you know, urban development, cities development is critical uh, to private sector development. Uh, as, you know, and in addition, Philippe, thank you for uh, talking about the links with the CFTA as well. Uh, and even, you know, maybe, uh, you know, Dr. Mayaki, we talk about uh, city partnerships across Africa as well. Uh, this is something that we've seen uh, done in, in, you know, in the US and other places. Uh, you know, maybe that can even, you know, catalyze, uh, you know, the uh, implementation of the CFTA. And, and I'm going to be meeting with uh, His Excellency Juan Kelly. Uh, many later today, and, and I will encourage him strongly to actually, you know, read digest this report and think through how to incorporate that uh, into his work on the CFTA. So thank you very, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. Uh, it's my turn to uh, to thank you, to thank uh, the the African Development Bank, but also the the Economic Commission for Africa and the team that uh, worked on this, uh, on this important report. I think we have a team, a joint team, and I hope that uh, this team will continue to, 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 to develop uh, a joint work because this is absolutely crucial. We are ready to continue to work with you and ECA, and we're proud of this uh, uh, cooperation. I would like also uh, to thank you because at the end of the day, you did not really make closing remarks. You opened the door for uh, new reflections. You opened the door for, uh, <coughs> for new perspectives, new debates, and this is important. And as I said, I think that we need to maintain this issue, this urban issue in the agenda, in the political agenda. And if we want to do so, we need to continue to nourish this agenda by facts, by evidences. And this is what we are committed for. And we hope that we will continue to do so with you and with the, the ECA. And uh, thank you very much to you, to uh, all the participants, and uh, for some of you, uh, uh, I hope that we will see you in, in Kisimu uh, very soon in, uh, uh, in Kenya uh, for AfriCity Summit. Thank you very much to everybody and have a nice afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Thank you for joining. Thank you. Bye.